Hi everyone, welcome to TED. Wow, what a first half, huh? Uh, what I can tell you is I've got paradoxical thinking in all caps, and I have make a coffee date with Wendy. Uh, just for the record, I like the suck helium for fun app. So. And the fuel cell technology, I'll be honest, way over my head, but it makes me hopeful. And that is a really important thing here at TED as well. So happy to be here. Thanks all the TED organizers for making it happen. We're going to kick off today with a project video that our students created in a current course that we're collaborating on along with another wonderful professor at the University of Delaware, John Cox, from the Department of Art. So we hope you enjoy the video and we're going to tell you a little bit more about it when it's over. Our mission is to educate children on how to prevent type 2 diabetes and encourage them to foster a healthy lifestyle from a young age. Children are being fed with high calorie foods without being educated on what is appropriate for them. According to CDC, in 2010, all U.S. states had more than 20% obesity rates, and some of the states have more than 30% of obesity rates. We decided to target type 2 diabetes at a local level because more and more children are becoming obese in the community due to unhealthy eating habits. Our product, the Sugar Cube, will be an electronic handheld device that children will use to interact with one another. Children will use this personal avatar as a fun and educational way to keep track of their diet and learn the potential effects of what they eat. We will use a program called Google SketchUp to bring our product to life. The development of our product will depend on experts from different fields, such as engineering, marketing, nutrition, and education. Once the product has been developed, we will collaborate with nutrition experts to drive this campaign in local school districts. We'll ask nutrition experts who regularly visit schools to explain and distribute the product to students as a way to introduce it to the children of the future. This particular video was made by this multidisciplinary group of students in week three of this semester. And it started by them finding a problem. So my question to you is, got a problem? <laughs> oh yes you do. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of them. And in fact, anytime we think about something that's working well but we want to make it better, it's a new problem. And we all have our own way of solving problems in our own special way at times. So what we'd like to do is help students move from problem solving to innovative problem solving. So we're going to tell you a little bit about educating for innovation. We decided to tackle innovation at the student level because, well, we're university professors and that's our audience. So we work with students to make sure they have an opportunity to see the world a little differently, to think a little bigger by engaging in a dynamic problem solving process. And so we want to share two of our experiences with you, or two of our tips with you. We call them our big points. Our big point number one. Big point number one is innovation is magic. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no. Innovation is a process. Big point number two. We want students to jostle their brains. We want them to shove themselves out of their boxes and shove each other out of their boxes. So in doing so, <laughs> Sorry. We challenge our students to look at alternate perspectives to engage in a higher level of innovation. So I'm going to tell you a little story. When I teach, um, I teach university students, I also teach at Longwood Gardens. These are continuing education students. These are adult learners. They have not been in the classroom for many years, many of them. They could be 20 years in nursing or in advertising. Um, so they haven't sat in front of a desk with a blank sheet of paper in front of them for a very long time. And they're here, being very brave in my classroom, about ready to start on and embark on a class and teaching them how to do landscape design work. This is a big challenge for most people, and the first thing I start them off with is, who's feeling really creative today? Who's a real artistic person who can really solve these problems in a very designerly way? I usually get one person who's been in a graphic artist field for a while and they're willing to share their half hand with me 
Everybody else is stone-faced, they're nervous, they're not ready to participate <coughs> like that. So what I tell them is that one percent, that one person, that's that creative genius magic, that's that model of magic that not everybody has. We can't all be that person. And for the other 99%, there's a process. And we can engage in a design solving process that gives us more innovative solutions and it makes them feel comfortable immediately. You see their shoulders start to slump and the worry moves off of their face and they get confident. All of a sudden, I can do this. If it's a process, that means I can engage in it and then when they're done with the class, they can re-engage in it again and again because we talk them through how a process works. So that's a way that we started to think about uh, how we can make a difference in um, process. And so how does process work? Well, we started our explorations like most of you start your explorations, over coffee. <laughs> and beer. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Brock, nice to meet you. Hello, Dr. Miller Brooks. Let me tell you, Dr. Brock, I understand that you're a very talented landscape designer. You have your own business. You've been doing this for about 10 years, and I've seen some of your landscapes. They're gorgeous. Thank you. Do you think you could walk me through your process so I can understand a little bit more about the steps you take? Sure. I learned my, uh, my design process in college, actually, and it's really based on making sure that my client <laughs> has a landscape that, they, that fits their needs. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do is interview my clients. I make sure that they're really... Um, able to share with me all their desires for what they want in their landscape. The next thing I do is I look at the site because it's a landscape, it has to be site specific. So I do a lot of in, um, analysis on what the clients need and what the site needs. After that, I go through an analysis phase that leads to figuring out the function of the space. So the functional diagramming happens and I figure out where spaces go and how people will circulate <coughs> through them. Once all those bubbles are formed on my sheet of paper, this is all done on trace paper, I turn that into form. And then I present a beautiful <coughs> color drawing to my client. They take a look at it, they're generally pretty happy with it. They'll say, wow, that's beautiful. Move on. So I develop a planting plan and then I build their garden. That's my process. Well, believe it or not, I was taking notes and juggling this remote. And it seems like in your process, we can divide that problem solving process down into three major phases. And I color coded them because I thought that would help us remember them. So in the first phase, understand, it's stop and understand the problem and the client. Correct. Sound right? And in the second phase, imagine the blue skies, think divergently, generate lots of ideas. And in the last phase, it's all about implement. Take those ideas and put them into action, but be cautious. That's the yellow. And it looks like this is how your process maps out. Is that correct? Yeah, that looks about right. Well, one thing I notice on here is that there's not a whole lot of the imagined phase. Typically, when you come up with these gorgeous landscapes, how many problems or how many rather solutions do you generate? I would say, using my trace paper, I probably, all by myself, sitting in my room, designing my designs, I probably come up with three or four solutions before I land on one that I work with. So how do you think your final product would change if you generated 40 or 50 or 100 ideas? Wow, I think it would be amazing, but I'm feeling a little vulnerable now. Wendy, <laughs> help me out. Um, that would change my whole process. <laughs> and spirit fingers back to the present. <laughs> what we decided to do was to create a class where we could interview and do further research from a whole variety of other designers from different fields. So we developed this course, and we call it Leadership by Design. It's a special topics course that's run at the University of Delaware in the leadership department. And we're able to, um, sorry, I think my microphone popped up, but if we're able to work with the students in a variety of ways in our class and engage a lot of different speakers who come in and talk to our students about their design process. So we'll invite <coughs> architects in and graphic artists and web designers. Um, what else? Well, in some of the more abstract fields of design, like organizational design, systems design, and even instructional design. And so from that research, we tried to pull together some commonalities and tried to create a tool for prompting folks. So we've developed this prompting tool called the Idea Fan Deck. And with that, we've <laughs> developed this process that allows us to walk our students through these three phases of 
the innovative problem solving process. So we allow them to walk in a prompting way through understand, imagine, and then implement. And we've color coded it thanks to our fabulous graphic design student, uh, Keeper, who's in the audience now. He's allowed us to uh, engage in this beautiful process and allow us to use color coding to enhance the design. Big point number two, innovation requires perspectives. And no, I'm not gonna ask any students to take a leap although we might. So as my friend Dr. Mike Dickman often says, your brain is a lean, mean, pattern-making machine. A lean, mean, pattern-making machine. And I'm gonna share with you one of my favorite activities that I do in classes to kind of help <coughs> jostle people's brains. So play along. If you could close your eyes for a moment, I'd like you to picture a man in a cabin on a mountain strapped to a chair, and he's dead. And my question is, how did he die? A man in a cabin, strapped to a chair, and he's dead. How did he die? So you can open your eyes. How many of you are picturing a log cabin? How many of you are picturing like some sort of an electric chair? Uh -huh. What if I told you this was a cabin of an airplane and he crashed into the mountain? <laughs> Man in a cabin strapped to a chair. So the point is that people, create conceptions of how they see the world. You construct information. And typically what happens is these tend to fall into silos. And these silos often align with the problem solving process. So Dr. Bruck's process initially shortchanged the imagined phase. Well, what if we tip the silos over and mixed everyone together and brought a number of <coughs> perspectives together? That's our assertion for enhancing innovation. And that's why we collaborate on our courses and we um, showed you the video to start off the talk and these are the majors from the students who participated in that video. What if you all saw problems using this depth of perspective? It would change the way our innovation occurs. So the other interesting thing about your mind being a lean mean pattern making machine and you're probably going to remember that for a long time because I keep saying lean mean pattern making machine. <laughs> Because your brain is a lean, mean pattern making machine and now you're making a pattern, right? <laughs> the other interesting thing is when I actually engage in this process and I ask folks how did he die, but you can ask me any question you want, the first 30 questions are did he die of an electric shock, did he, did he die of natural causes, did he die of a heart attack? That's because your brain not only creates pictures, but it creates habitual ways of processing information. And one habitual way of processing information that we have found extraordinarily effective in jostling people's brains is our favorite design thinking. Here at TED, you've probably heard design thinking a few times from Tim Brown and others. Uh, extremely valuable. And you'll notice that for us, this fills in the negative space that connects understand, imagine, and implement. And gives us the full picture of that process moving forward. So let's do the math. We have our big point number one, we have design processes. We have big point number two, which we call design thinking. And if you multiply them, you get what we're calling design-based learning. It's an educational approach to teaching students how to become more innovative and solve problems in the classroom by using, utilizing multiple resources, uh, looking outside the classroom walls for alternate perspectives, iterating so that they don't land on their first solution because we often see our students will take their first solution and try and take that into fruition and, and make that their product. But we like to them to think of a hundred different solutions first and then make the process more valuable in that regard. So in our last few minutes of fame here, we're going to share a few um, student projects with you that we've incorporated design-based learning with. Uh, this is a, a multiple disciplinary group of students who are tasked with designing something that, like they gave a damn, which is Cameron Sinclair's book, Architecture for Humanity. Another great TED talk if you have the opportunity, Cameron Sinclair. Uh, they took on the problem of the lack of funds for music education, in, particularly in urban schools. And so this is an early prototype of them putting together a musical <coughs> instrument that was both affordable and portable and capitalized on different facets of learning music. And that was about their fifth or sixth prototype in a class where all these students have different majors. 
Another project that we worked on um, as a collaboration was at the Philadelphia Flower Show, we put together an exhibit. This exhibit was a collaboration between the art department, the plant and soil science department, the leadership department here at University of Delaware. It produced a exhibit that students were able to prototype in class and then build and then have an educational message about rainwater harvesting, a concept that many leadership students, for example, would never have in their curriculum. But we gave them an opportunity to engage in this information, and now they know more about rainwater harvesting, which will make them a better stewards of the environment, whether they end up in an urban or suburban environment. So we were able to do this great show and display, which was a fabulous and wonderful exhibit. And we're gonna wrap with the one that we started with, not rap in the musical way, but <laughs> this is uh, the, the project that's going on this semester where we've combined three different classes, an art class, a landscape design class, and a leadership class. And we've also are working with UDC, which is part of entrepreneurial studies. So in essence, we're looking at the fields that deal with understand, imagine, and implement all at the same time, trying to put that full picture together. And if you go on UDC, I think it's uc.co, uh, you'll actually see all 10 project videos in these initial stages of uh, the project. So we want to leave you with just a few things to think about while you're about to head out onto break. First of all, we'd love to challenge you to always think to generate more ideas. Don't be afraid of changing your paradigm, maybe being a little vulnerable to a new way of thinking about your process. And so generate lots and lots of solutions. On, a, on any given problem that you're tasked with. And your second challenge, as you deal with all these problems that you have, is to really try to find some alternate perspectives and invite those folks to the table so that you can learn from them and ultimately enhance your innovation. And we have a little summary toy for you to come that you'll receive as you come back from your break. Beyond that, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.